The Root. That which exists outside of the world, outside of space and time, aware of all aspects in every dimension all at once. All that ever was, all that ever will be, can be found deep within the swirl of the root. It is everything, and yet it is nothing which can be comprehended by mere human thought. It is the base of existence, the connection between all things which is precisely why many mages wish to reach it, touch it, and understand its secrets. However, even if a human could accomplish this, even if they could touch it for even the smallest moment, they would enter a state beyond the mass they exhibit and never return. Because they have entered a state of godhood, are they unable to escape from its grasp, or do they simply Die. The mages of this world know it to exist, but even in our little cranial ship of the imagination, it is unfathomable to know what it must feel like, what it is exactly one must see for certain. Therefore, many mages seek it for many different reasons, through different means providing different philosophies regarding how it affects all of us. This may sound like gibberish to common folk, but it is a very important concept to understand, not just for the world of fate, but the entire Type Moon universe. Many character goals and motivations become impacted by, or are focused on the root as it is also responsible for housing the throne of heroes. Ah yes, you may have believed it to be the holy grail which held this pool of souls in its basin. But the cup is merely a medium, a wish-granting device of great and terrible power, which is capable of plucking souls from the throne of heroes. And of all the souls the mighty grail could pluck out to bring salvation to humanity while at its most dire, perhaps Summoning a highly controversial philosopher may not be as far-fetched as you might initially speculate. Yelena Petrovna Blavatsky. In this dimension born as a magical prodigy through a strange, unique mutation, she claimed to be able to hear the voices of distant, greater beings, which she calls the Mahatmas, Sanskrit for great soul, similar to how English-speaking peoples use the term saint. For Elena, through her intuition and obsession with mysticism, these Mahatmas taught her many wisdoms through her mind's eye. And although proof of their existence is sketch at best, her sheer overwhelming knowledge in all magecraft and ease of applying it in practice during her time alive was confirmation that at least something was indeed granting her immense power. Summoning, black magics, alchemy, elemental conversion, rune magecraft, it all came easy to her. Therefore, she inevitably trusted these Mahatmas to be pioneers from many generations of magecraft whom had housed themselves inside the swirl of the root, which has led her to debate and argue with London's Mages Association on innumerable occasions. Madame Blavatsky was a well-known traveler. Although she could have lived an easy life with an aristocratic husband in her home country of Russia, she quickly left it all in search of a purpose with which to utilize her gifts. And if you have been so fortunate as to summon her for yourselves, masters, it's easy to tell that she is quite proud of these gifts. Appropriate, given some of the people she has made friends with in life who also carried with them rather strong inclinations. Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, the Madame cheerfully claims to be the creator of all modern magic and to know everything. This is, of course, suspect, but not without some creation as, I repeat, she is immensely capable. So capable, in fact, that she would successfully found her own philosophical religious sect, along with her grisly American traveling companion, Colonel Henry Olcott, who would later take on the mantle till his death as the very first president of Blavatskian theosophy. The esoteric belief that all things are united as one, and cyclical by nature. It should be noted that this is not a rejection of religion beliefs, but rather meant to be a philosophy to live by and acknowledge, which also accepts the idea of a god or other higher existence responsible for all creation. It's legitimately interesting and inviting, I suggest checking it out for a good read sometime. In fact, Madame Blavatsky was so enticed by other religions than Christianity that she considered India, seeping in Hindu ideology, to be the place her soul belonged. 
And this is no coincidence. Hinduism is the world's oldest major religion to develop any sort of connection with gods in higher places. A logical lead to finding answers to the Mahatmas, and by extension, the root. Though she is a woman of many mysteries, even to herself if you ask her how she's managed to look approximately 12 years old all of her life, it is no secret that the Madame seeks many answers, all likely in one way or another involving the Root. It's made even clearer still if you just squint your eyes hard enough at her chest. Now avoid those dirty thoughts, you perverts in the audience, and take a keen notice toward the design on her badge. It's the symbol of the Ten Spherot, each representing a faculty of the soul imbued upon humans and the world around us by God himself. Formed in the pattern of a tree to grant us some little understanding for the process of the creation of all things. The Tree of Life, as it's also known. A great tree, with the root Malhut, the divine presence. Interestingly enough, Yelena's artist, Matsuryu, eventually posted on his Twitter what was his original draft for the character, with this to say. At first I was designing a concept of a beautiful Russian girl in a military uniform, but I settled down with the current design after having a briefing session with Mr. Takeuchi. Concerning the results, I think it resulted in her appearing more like a caster, but I did not think her noble phantasm would unexpectedly become something like that, lol. These are just my feelings on the matter, but I don't care for it. Everything about this design looks too inconvenient for any person to wear, and lacks any purpose or meaning. It's just a busty anime chick, I'm sorry. And the real-life Yelena Bravotsky wasn't militant or military personnel. That was Olcott, and even he was lesser known for his acting service, and instead more known for how he was a savior for the Buddhists of Sri Lanka facing mass segregation. Fortunately, it doesn't seem like Matsuryu felt too deeply about this design, though, since he will occasionally post new, beautiful artwork of Madame Blavatsky painted by himself through his Twitter account at completely random times. Of course, I prefer her this way. She's my little purple noodle granny and I love her very much. Casters are also my personal favorite class among the main primary classes, so I appreciate Madame Blavatsky looking the part. And about that familiar floating above her? That is her self-crafted automation meant to impersonate Colonel Olcott upon being summoned. It is designed to clean up after her, but it's charming that she would think so highly of her aforementioned traveling companion to the point that she would keep a helpful reminder of him by her side at all times. Best of all, when she finally received a summer alternative version, not only did it, albeit vaguely, act as a result of her role in the Agartha chapter, but her style points put every other bikini-clad heroine to shame. She looks like Eurobeat personified, armed with a nerf gatling gun taller and wider than she stands. She's living every kid's dream, while appropriately going full lolly to match. If it wasn't obvious by now, everything I've explained about Elena up to this point has been nothing short of a series of strong positives for the character. But the ultimate good she does for Fate Grand Order has been staring at us in the face this entire time. Most servants summoned from history are so far gone from modern day that they can be difficult to relate to. We may be able to empathize with many of them as people, but they existed so long ago that their influence is never truly felt in the grand scheme of the stories they're part of within the Type Moon universe. Elena Blavatsky, on the other hand, according to the lore, is heavily implied to have made direct effects on the greater world we know in fate, akin to Waver Velvet later on in his life, but on a much grander scale. She also possesses vast knowledge relevant to what the majority of modern characters completely originated from Type Moon adhere to, specifically toward the Root, which is titanically important given its sphere of influence crossing over pretty much everything everywhere. There exist other modern heroes, yes, but most of them are just well-known names who can kick ass, or gentlemen who are famous for inventing basic functions we take for granted in everyday life. Elena knows things, has experienced things, 
things, all significant to those of us invested in these narratives. The core of why we are even here in the first place. But ironically enough, what I believe solely keeps her from being on the same tier of legendary prophets and thinkers as Merlin and Sherlock Holmes respectively, is her own self-absorbed nature. She is usually very kind to others, but she can also just as easily become condescending and very stubborn when she believes she is taking the right approach. Let us not forget that she is approaching her 60s in this form. It may be funnily symbolic that she would perpetually look like a child all of her life, since childhood and elderly obstinance are <laughs> Basically one and the same. If only Kinoko Nasu would allow us to chip away what's bouncing around inside her brain and enlighten us to the voices she is receiving, I think it would be incredibly fascinating just to listen to her finally talk. By her fifth Bond level, she's claimed me as her disciple and promises to spill her secrets. So please teach me, Elena Sensei. I am more than ready for you to blow my mind. Makes me feel alive. Take that money, watch it burn, sink in the river, the lessons I've learned.